At long last, the battle has ended. And thus, Ghana, your beloved country, is free forever. From now on, there is a new African in the world. That new African is ready to fight his own battle and show that after all, the black man is capable of managing his own affairs. We are going to demonstrate to the world, to the other nations, young as we are, that we are prepared to lay our own foundation. We are going to see that we create our own African personality and identity. And we again rededicate ourselves not only in the struggle to emancipate other territories in Africa. Our independence is meaningless unless it is linked up the total repression of the African continent. <laughs> I want you all, those who have hearts on, to take off your hearts and let the band pray our national anthem. And from now on, that national anthem is the national anthem of the Gogo to be played on all occasions. Freedom. 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 God bless you. So after the declaration of independence in 1957, uh, Osage Dr. Kwame Nkrumah was made uh, the Prime Minister, uh, head of government business, and he was a Prime Minister up until 1960 when the country became a republic and we fully gained independence from the British and so uh, he was inaugurated as the president and that is what you find on your screen Nkrumah together with his wife Fatia Nkrumah and this is the inauguration service of Osage for Dr. Kwame Nkrumah as uh, the president of the Republic of Ghana and He's heading towards the National Assembly for the uh, ceremony to take place. And don't also forget about the, um, the disagreement between the educated elite as well as the chiefs. And by this time, Nkrumah had promulgated the 1954 constitution and it had uh, taken off all the seats that belonged to the chiefs uh, in the uh, National Assembly. So that is the state sword. Uh, you find Nkrumah holding and that is the same seat uh, today uh, we use in our uh, integration service our ceremony and he Nkrumah is taking the oath of office uh, and that is what you find in some very very uh, beautiful pictures up there so one of the uh, biggest achievement of the CPP government under uh, Sajifu Dr. Kwame Nkrumah was the uh, construction of the Akosomo Dam uh, and it was completed in 1966, the same year that Nkrumah was overthrown. And Nkrumah um, established this dam or constructed this dam uh, to power the industries that he had planned to establish in the country because he believed that for the country or for, the, for Ghana to be truly independent, there was the need for uh, the country to achieve economic independence. And so he built uh, these factories in order to power the country, uh, to, 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 to make the economy of the country strong. And so that was the reason uh, behind the establishment or the construction of the uh, Kosovo Dam, basically to power the industry. In the subsequent videos, we shall take and listen to his speech on that day. Uh, and it is well to note that he was overthrown just the following month after opening the dam. And so last Saturday, all was judged ready for a formal inauguration, with young pioneers, acolytes of the new Ghana, and chiefs, cheerfully meaningless relics of the old Ghana, 
but adding solemnity to the moment of national self-congratulation. And finally, Dr. Nkrumah himself, a sergeant for the president, in vice-regal motor car and sunny mood. This was his dad. He'd borrowed the money, approved the plans, all but built it. Problems were for another day. Budget day, in point of fact, in a fortnight's time, when Ghanaians will learn that they're drastically overspent. But not on the dam, on other, less easily justifiable projects. The dam will pay for itself by the sale of power. Ladies and gentlemen, we live in a world of contradictions. These contradictions, however, keep the world going. Let me explain what I mean. Ghana is a small but very dynamic independent African state. We are trying to reconstruct our economy and to build a new free and equal society. To do this, we must attain control of our own economic and political destinies. Only thus can we create higher living standards for our people and free them from the legacies and hazards of a colonial past and from the encroachment of neo-colonialism. Neo-colonialism, meaning American investment in Africa. His audience knew it was a bad thing. Osage of had just published a book attacking it. Odd, though, there was American investment in this dam. A further irony, it was that book which made it necessary for Mrs. Nkrumah to open the dam instead of Mrs. Kennedy, as Dr. Nkrumah had hoped. The American government were annoyed by the book and advised Mrs. Kennedy not to go. The fiction that she'd be there was maintained till the last moment, but in the end it was Mrs. Nkrumah who unveiled a plaque marked Unveiled by Mrs. Jacqueline Kennedy. With Mr. Kaiser, engineering and aluminium king, the president then came forward to switch on lights. Mr. Kaiser had spoken, but hadn't explained the other major oddity of the Volta scheme, that the power is to be used to smelt processed bauxite into aluminium, and the processed bauxite is being imported, although Ghana runs over with raw bauxite. But when the lights came on, and the fireworks, these oddities were forgotten in the glow. So apparently on the 24th of February, uh, 1966, Sajifu Dr. Kwame Nkrumah, the first Prime Minister and first President of the First Republic, was overthrown in a military coup led by uh, Major General A.A. A. Afrifa, uh, Emmanuel uh, Kutuka, and uh, J.A. Ankara. And these people overthrew Nkrumah for several reasons. Some spanning from political to economic to social uh, reasons. And so uh, Major General Afrifa and the uh, military junta formed the National Liberation Council, which was headed by J.A. Ankara. Uh, in our subsequent videos, we shall take a look at why the military decided to overthrow uh, Osage Dr. Kwame Nkrumah from a press conference. The organized by the National Liberation Council, led by J.A. Ankara. Now, it is important to note that after the overthrow of, of Nkrumah, everything about him was uh, destroyed, even including cars that bear uh, his name were all, you know, cancelled. Statues of Nkrumah uh, were all pulled down, as you can see in the uh, video. Uh, I believe that it was the plan of the military junta to actually erase Nkrumah from 
uh, the history books of Ghana. And so even his, his ideological center at Winneba, all the books there were bent down. The promises uh, for properties were all you know, um, destroyed, as you can find in your stream. Um, this huge uh, giant statue of Nkrumah was also pulled down. Let's take a look at the uh, reaction of Ghanaians after Nkrumah was overthrown. During Nkrumah's overthrow, there were some uh, political prisoners who were detained under the Preventive Detention Act (PDA). Uh, and so, after uh, Nkrumah was overthrown, all these uh, political prisoners were actually uh, released, and that is what you find on your screen. These people were kept in prison because they were deemed to have been uh, behind bombings, uh, bombing attacks on the president. Uh, whilst he was still in power, a lot of these people were detained without trial under the PDA by Nkrumah. So let's take and listen to some of the prisoners uh, that were liberated after the overthrow of Assad. The period that was there, I think about some, say between 10 to 15 people died at the time I was there. How were you treated here? Before I was sent to prison here, I was in chains and um, handcuffs for Sistine Goodmans. Were you in chains and handcuffs all the time? Yeah, for Sistine Goodmans in the place here. How did you feel when you learned you were going to be let out? Oh, I'm very happy, sir. How long were you in detention? I've been in detention for nearly five years now. How did they treat you? Well, I was not so badly treated, but uh, the lockups were too much for us. We were kept in custody for about three months without uh, given any air. What about the food and general treatment? The food is generally poor, very, very poor, and had caused a lot of uh, illness to us, to many of us. What did you feel when you heard you were being allowed out? I felt that uh, probably the army might have taken power. Otherwise, the wicked government would not permit anybody to be released because we were told that we would remain in detention for the rest of our lives. So right after the coup, the coup plotters that overthrew Assad of Dr. Pame in Koma, the National Liberation Council met uh, the press and they actually told them uh, their reason uh, behind the overthrow of Assad of Dr. Pame in Koma. Now, the man you find on your screen is Jay Ankara. He will be introducing them uh, very shortly. But they will introduce a certain guy who, after the overthrow of Nkrumah, was deemed to be associated with the coup. I think he was parading himself that he was behind uh, the coup. And so uh, the military officers decided to bring him to come and testify if indeed he was the brain behind the coup because there was so much uh, rumors in the uh, public that Nkrumah's coup was instigated from outside. But to Jay Ankara, who led the 
our leaders, he said the coup was instigated by Ghanaians themselves. Let's take and listen to you. On my right is Major General E.K. Kotoka, who is the second member or the first member of the National Liberation Council. Uh, we have called you here this morning for one specific reason, and that is you heard the name of one Amuhia who has associated himself with this school and had published himself in the British papers and most of the papers that is the brain behind us. And we want to prove that we were not instigated by anybody, neither we want to refute any allegation that ACA or God knows what has in, in, uh, instigated us to carry out the school. This school was carried out completely because of the things that had happened in Ghana and of the, of the, uh, because of the tyranny and the partisan of Kwame Nkrumah, the deposed president. Everybody in Ghana was fed up with it. And therefore, you could see this spontaneous uh, result which uh, followed the coup. You would have seen when you were coming, probably thinking that Ghana would have been put under curfew or all other things, but nothing was done. There was no drain behind it. It was work from us and from within, without the aid of anybody, any foreign country or any country. <laughs> It has been some of these things in Ghana that when a ruler is useless, you depose him. And therefore, we have deposed Kwame Nkrumah. We don't want tyranny or anything here. And therefore, I would like to not waste time to bring in Amu here, here for you to see him. And you can see that he doesn't even know. I don't know him. I haven't seen him before. Neither is any of us. The only thing that we know of him since he started claiming himself was that the COP found in his records that he's a criminal who is wanted in Ghana. And we were so quiet because we wanted him, he's a criminal wanted in Ghana, so that we put him in the cold ice chest. Well, um, this is Mr. Amuhia. He calls himself Amuhia or Amushia or ever. His name is never spelled correct either. And we would like him to tell you how he organized this coup and how he was the brain behind it. And who he knew on this. First and foremost, on the 24th morning, 8 o'clock news announced in London that Ghana has announced that Jointly, the army and the police have overthrown the regime of the terror, Kwame Nkrumah. Did yes, you sir. come to uh, brainwash me, Kotoka, uh, the police, or somebody, and tell us how to conduct this, or yes, did you try to tell us where we should, uh, how we should organize our army, or the operations to carry, they carried out? No, sir. This is exactly what I am coming to, sir. No, if I you. should be given the opportunity, I shall explain thoroughly, as I am before you and before the world press. So after the coup. Emmanuel Kutuka, who was a brain behind the overthrow of Asadi Dr. Kwame Nkrumah, and uh, Dr. K. A. Bujia were interviewed overseas and um, about the way forward for the country and how things were progressing after the overthrow of Asadi Dr. Kwame Nkrumah in 1966. And so uh, let's take a look at the interview uh, granted by these two people. And bear in mind, uh, Dr. K. A. Bujia will later become uh, the Prime Minister of Ghana with Edward Ekufu Ado as the President in the Second Republic of Ghana. How is the reconstruction of the country going since the overthrow of the Nakuma regime? I think very well indeed. It's going very well. Everybody is working hard and we hope it won't be long when things will be on a good footing. Returning to ex-president Nkrumah, uh, do you think he'll ever try to return to Ghana? We'll be very pleased indeed to have him back in Ghana. 
I will give him the red carpet. Thank you, sir. very difficult to say. If they work fast, we are prepared to hand over as soon as things are ready, when the constitution is drawn, and uh, when probably they've finished. You know there are a lot of uh, commissions going on at present in which uh, quite a lot of people, parliamentarians, some civil servants and uh, public officers have been uh, uh, affected. And when these are the commissions are going on now. This will lead to trials. When uh, we finish cleaning this mess, as we call it, uh, the constitution is written, referred to the constituent assembly, and then uh, throw it to the country in the form of a uh, how do you say, mm -hmm. referendum, then we'll hand over. And we, I don't know, I can't say. It depends on how fast they, uh, they work. No, we are sincere. We are serious. We are serious. No, I don't think uh, you can imagine how one man can hold three ministries, portfolios for three ministries. It's really a burden on us. We are not happy about it ourselves. So you should take us seriously. General Kostner, are you, as a member of the National Liberation Council of Ghana, concerning yourself at all with the problem of the Ghanaian students in London and other countries who've had their bursaries and scholarships withdrawn? No, that is a matter for the High Commissioner here, and he will see to any petitions forwarded by the students. Your government statement on the withdrawal of these scholarships has said that those students who are qualified for further training in Ghanaian institutions will get it, others will have the opportunity to serve in the reconstruction of their country. What role do you see for them in the reconstruction of Ghana? Those who are qualified will be employed in positions where they can help reconstruct Ghana. Those who are not qualified and are ready to pursue their studies further, uh, will have to go into institutions where they can pursue their studies. And those who are neither qualified nor capable of pursuing further studies? They will have to serve Ghana in any capacity in which they are qualified. Such as teaching, farming? Well, if they are qualified for teaching, they may take teaching. If they are qualified for farming, they may farm. If they can't do any of these... Specifically Ghanaian problems there. Uh, the one prominent in my mind is about the refugees who are at present with Prominent Kuma in Ghana now, uh, in Guinea, in Guinea now. Uh, I might raise that with the United Nations officials uh, to see whether they can help us repatriate these Ghanaians who are willing to come back but are denied the opportunities of coming back. And those who are not willing to come back who are in fact working with Nkrumah in Guinea, would you raise the subject of them too? There might be just a very few indeed, very, very few, like um, Bruce Yankee and some few diehards. But the greater majority, I'm sure, would like to come back to Ghana. Turning to relations with Britain, Finally, sir. General Kotaka, as a member of the National Liberation Council of Ghana, are you concerned with the problem of the students who've recently had their bursaries and scholarships withdrawn? The government statement on these students said that those who were qualified would be invited to return to Ghana and help in the reconstruction of their... I am the elected 
uh, head of the government of Ghana. There has not been an election. There has only been an adventure by a small band of the military people stationed in Accra. Your information at the moment then is that this coup has not been successful? My information is that the coup hasn't got nationwide support. Do you know the Lieutenant Colonel who has led this coup? Only by name. The coup leaders have uh, accused you of malpractices <coughs> and arbitrary arrests. What do you say to that? There has not been a single person detained in the two years that I have been in office. And these preposterous charges, I think anybody in Ghana who knows me knows the truth and knows this is senseless nonsense. What are you going to do now? Are you going to fly back to Accra? I am not saying what I am going to do, except that I will not let my people down and they will soon know my next move. Do you feel there's any chance at all that this military coup will in the end be successful or not? I have no doubt that it will fail. Do you feel very depressed tonight? I am sad. I am sad because I can think of the tragedy this would be for Africa and particularly for Ghana. And that of course ma makes me sad. But I am not depressed in the sense that I have no faith or confidence in eventual victory. We shall win through. Fellow countrymen, my heart is heavy as I witness the damage which this clique of neo-colonialist conspirators are doing to our country. At the bidding of their overseas neo-colonialist masters, they are dismantling the work of 50 years. They are telling you that Ghana is bankrupt. They are telling you that our country is in debt to the extent of some 240 million pounds. What fools they are. How ignorant for them to think that you believe these stupid lies. Open your eyes and look around you. See for yourself. See the splendid new Tamahago. See the mighty water dam. See the fine roads which we have built under the leadership of the Convention People's Party and its government. See the schools, the colleges, and the universities. See the clinics, hospitals, health centers, and the facilities which we have created. See the factories, which are already springing up. These are no debts. These are not debts. They are investments in our future as an independent nation. These are the physical guarantees of the bright new future, which I have promised you and I have been working for. Together, we can put our Ghana family and squarely on its own feet. Together, we can create the things we need for ourselves instead of going cap in hand for charity handouts from foreign powers whose only wish is to exploit us and make us vassals to their interests. I know these are hard and trying days for you. I have never tried to conceal from you that real independence, that is to say economic independence, does not come without hard struggle and sacrifice. Unlike the cheats and deceivers, the liars and traitors who are now trying to lord it over you, I have never promised you any easy road. I have respected your good sense, your capacity for work, your pride in yourselves, and your sense of national dignity. Why do you think these traitors, these agents and lackeys of colonialism and of international intrigue to destroy the independence of Ghana, chose this moment to perform their dastardly act? I will tell you, less than one month before they struck to destroy all our hard work, we had inaugurated the first electricity from the Volta Dam. Only three days before this treachery, we had signed a new agreement to irrigate the mighty Accra Prince. At last, we were on the threshold of a great new victory. We had in 1957 won our political independence after years of struggle. Now in 1966, we were at the threshold of winning our economic independence. The same people 
who tried to sabotage our winning of political independence nine years ago have now stopped to sabotage our economic independence and are systematically dismantling our socialist gains and achievement. Before the traitors and the rebellious National Liberation Council tried to usurp power during my absence from Ghana, Ghana was a heaven to which the oppressed from all parts of Africa could come to carry on their struggle. It was a heaven for freedom fighters, for independence and against colonialism. The name of Ghana was revered all over the African continent as a staunch friend of the oppressed. African brothers from South Africa, from Rhodesia, from Mozambique and Angola, from the so-called Portuguese Guinea and the Cape Verde Islands and other oppressed colonial areas were given hospitality amongst us. Do you think that this is something of which we needed to be ashamed? Not at all. On the contrary, it was something of which we should be justly proud. Haven't we proclaimed that the independence of Ghana is meaningless until it is linked up with the total liberation of Africa? Now, hundreds of these brave freedom fighters who came to our country trusting us to look after them and help them in their struggle against colonial oppression and believing as we do that Africa and the struggle for freedom is indivisible. These brave men and women have been sent back, bag and baggage, by this traitorous clique to the countries from which they have fled to seek refuge, inspiration and protection in Ghana. Countrymen, a new phase of the African Revolution has been reached. This revolution must overcome and triumph over imperialism, racialism, and neocolonialism. It must finally usher in the total emancipation and the political unification of our continent. Africa must be free. Africa must be united. In April 1967, a year into uh, in Krumah's overthrown, there were uh, counter coups against the National Liberation Council uh, led by J.A. Ankara. Uh, there were some group of soldiers who also uh, decided to overthrow the National Liberation Council and in their operation it was called the Operation uh, Jetai Boys. Uh, however, their coup was not successful because the um, NLC, the National Liberation Council, was successful in dealing with the coup. However, uh, at the end of the coup, Emmanuel Kutuka, who was instrumental uh, during the uh, coup against Nkrumah, uh, was killed uh, in that coup. And so the coup uh, plotters uh, were lined up and they were given a tribunal trial, as you have seen on your screen. Uh, and so J. Ankara, the leader of the National Liberation Council, who brief uh, the press about uh, the developments that has taken place and the measures taken by the National Liberation Council in ensuring that the country was safe and that the government was also safe. Let's take and listen to J. A. Ankara's um, press conference uh, for concerning the issue. Let's also take a key note as to what will happen to these coup plotters who are also plotted same to overthrow uh, the National Liberation Council, their fate as a stance. We would like this morning to tell you the steps we have taken since last Monday. A. Steps have been taken to enforce the security of the vulnerable points of the government. Service inquiry have begun to investigate the circumstances leading to the murder of Lieutenant General Kotoka, <coughs> Captain Aveva, Captain Buckle, and Sergeant Usai Grunchi. And also to establish as far as possible the origin and motive of this insurrection. <coughs> we hope 
that these investigations now in progress will cover all possible aspects of the security of the state. Meanwhile, proceedings have begun to try by military tribunal those who have identified, have been identified as being directly responsible for the murder of Lieutenant General Kotoka. This trial will begin next week. I'd like to here <coughs> yeah, now mention that as far as we've got the master plan which we have discovered indicates clearly an intention of John Junior officers who had planned to assassinate all senior officers to the rank of Lieutenant Connor. Thompson, Sasu Bafowa. Tribunal sentence you to death by shooting. The tribunal sentence you to death by shooting. Augustus, Lieutenant Augustus Owusujima, the tribunal sentence you to death by shooting. Kufiusu, the tribunal sentence you to 25 years imprisonment. Lieutenant Samuel Benjamin Arthur. Stop. The tribunal sentenced you to death by firing squad. March him out. GH601 Lieutenant Moses Yaboa. Stop. The tribunal sentenced you to death by firing squad. March him out. GH976, second left hand, Osefoku. The tribunal sentenced you to 30 years imprisonment of hard labor. As indicated earlier, the NLC were caretakers and therefore they put in place measures uh, to return the country into civilian rule within the shortest possible time. And so to this end, on November 15, 1966, the NLC appointed a 16-member constitutional commission under the chairmanship of Chief Justice Ekufu Ado the then Chief Justice to draft a constitution for the country. The political party's decree of April 1969 announced the lifting of the ban on the formation of political parties from May 1st, 1969. August 29th, 1969 was fixed as the date for the general election 
and September 30th, 1969 as the date by which our powers will be handed to an elected a government. With the lifting of the ban on the formation of political parties, many political parties were formed in the country. In the end, five political parties survived the campaign and contested the election. These were the Progress Party, PP, led by K. A. Buzia, the National Alliance of Liberals, NAL, also led by K. Gwedema, the All People's Republican Party, APRP, led by P. K. K. Kwedu, the People's Action Party, PAP, uh, led by Imoru Ayana, and finally, the United Nationalist Party, UNP, led by Dr. H. S. Banama. There were 140 seats to be contested. The election took place as scheduled on 29th August 1969, and the results came as a surprise to everybody. The Progress Party of Dr. K. A. Bujia gained a landslide victory by winning 105 of the seats. The National Alliance of Liberals, led by Gwedema, also won 29 of the seats. On 3rd September, Dr. Buzia, the leader of the Progress Party, was sworn in as the Prime Minister of the Second Republic of Ghana. And that is what you find on your screen. It is important to note that in the 1969 election, the National Liberation Council banned the CPP from contesting in the election. And so the CPP was not represented in the 1969 election. Uh, and so members of the CPP uh, broke, they broke away uh, from the CPP and formed their own um, government, especially K.A. Bidima, who formed the National Alliance of Liberals. Now, the Second Republic was inaugurated at the Independence Square on October 1st, 1969, with, with uh, Dr. Kofi Abifa Bujia as the Prime Minister. Uh, the video in your shot is a retired Chief Justice Edward Okufu Adu, who was one of the big six, was elected as the President and Ceremonial Head of State. Uh, this was as a result of the 1969 Constitution, which provided for a Ceremonial President as Head of State and a Prime Minister who was the Chief who was the Chief Executive Officer and so that is what you find in your screen the inauguration of the Second uh, Republic and uh, Edward Kufu Ado being sworn in as the President of the Republic of Ghana so after these uh, ceremonies a state uh, banquet was organized to inaugurate the Second uh, Republic to celebrate uh, the achievement of the country after the overthrow of Assad with Dr. Kwame Nkrumah uh, in 1966 and that is two to three years ago and so you find guests from even other countries uh, at a dinner party to actually celebrate the success of the country at this point. So the next thing to do after the immigration service was the swearing in of civilian government uh, ministers in Ghana uh, led by Abuja. Take note of the presence of the army, the NLC, Afrifa, Amankwa Afrifa in there. You could see that the army, the National Liberation Council was part of the process all throughout, even though this election was supposed to be uh, a civilian election, a democratic one, but you can find the presence of the army all around them. You can see uh, Major General A.A. Afrifa uh, uh, giving out the certificate uh, to these newly appointed uh, ministers in the Republic. Did you see uh, Kofo? Yeah, Kofo came in there if you saw uh, Kofo over there. In April 1970, 
a statue of a Lieutenant General Emmanuel Kutuka was unveiled at the Kutuka International Airport. Uh, the airport was named after him. Um, now, let me remind you, in case you have forgotten, Kutuka was killed uh, during the abortive coup uh, led by the Operation Jetai Boys. And in that coup, even though the coup was abolished, was not successful, Emmanuel Kutuka died in that coup and so a statue was unveiled in 1970 by the civilian government the progress party to actually uh, celebrate this uh, gallant uh, soldier who uh, was instrumental in the overthrow of the first uh, republic of ghana and the question i ask is that uh, sh sh is it that the pp or the progress party actually supported the coup against Nkrumah? Uh, killing or overthrowing a civilian elected uh, president and they had to celebrate this man who overthrew a legitimate uh, government uh, of which was voted by the people and that's that statue of Emmanuel Kutuka. In 1972, three years after the integration of the Second Republic, Colonel Ignatius Kutu Echampon overthrew the Progress Party led by K.A. Bujia and established the National Redemption Council. Let's take and listen to why he overthrew the Progress Party, BP. The government is a military government which will rule with advice from certain eminent civilians in the country. I would like to emphasize immediately that this coup was not initiated by the armed forces merely to satisfy our selfish ends. As I said in my earlier broadcasts, the takeover was occasioned principally by the hypocrisy of the Buzia regime coupled with the inefficient management by that regime of our economy. The malpractices which existed before the 1966 coup are still with us and there was no prospect of seeing an end of them. Matters got steadily worse, especially in the economic field and it became obvious that the Bolivia government had no clue as to how to arrest the position. Yes. In simple terms, we are almost like a nation at war without an external enemy. The National Redemption Council has therefore decided to place the economy of Ghana on a war footing. We are soldiers with no one way of dealing with crisis situations and that is action. I want to ensure the nation that we shall aspire, we shall spare no effort and no sac sacrifice will be too great for us in this gigantic task of winning a great economic war. This was an interview uh, granted by K.A. Bujia after his overthrow in 1972 by Colonel Ignatius Kutu Echampo. At the time of the coup, K. Bujia was not in the country. He was in London for medical checkup and he got the news as it was in the case of Osadjevu Dr. Kwame Nkrumah. Abuja got the news that he had been overthrown and so the press in London decided to uh, interact with him and ask him about his way forward after the coup. It is also important to note that at this uh, time or period Sajibu Dr. Kwame Nkrumah was still in exile. He had not returned to Ghana after he was overthrown in 1966. And so in 1972, when he heard that Abuja had been overthrown, he actually uh, wrote a letter to Abuja, uh, you know, either advising him or 
anything of that sort you can check out in my other videos i have the letter a copy of the letter you can read it for yourself and it is so 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 interesting after some few uh, months after the overthrow of Bujia, uh, Kwame Nkrumah died. I am the elected uh, head of the government of Ghana. There has not been an election. There has only been an adventure by a small band of the military people stationed in Accra. Your information at the moment then is that this coup has not been successful? My information is that the coup hasn't got nationwide support. Do you know the Lieutenant Colonel who has led this coup? Only by name. The coup leaders have uh, accused you of malpractices <coughs> and arbitrary arrests. What do you say to that? There has not been a single person detained in the two years that I have been in office and these preposterous charges i think anybody in ghana who knows me knows the truth and knows this is senseless nonsense what are you going to do now are you going to fly back to accra i am not saying what i'm going to do except that i will not let my people down and they will soon know my next move do you feel there's any chance at all that this military coup will in the end be successful or not I have no doubt that it will fail. Do you feel very depressed tonight? I am sad. I am sad because I can think of the tragedy this would be for Africa and particularly for Ghana. And that of course me makes me sad. But I am not depressed in the sense that I have no faith or confidence in eventual victory. We shall win through. <laughs> Sajifu Dr. Kwame Nkrumah died on the 27th of April 1972 uh, in Romania and uh, Nkrumah had been in exile since 1969 and so because of that at the Guinea government where Nkrumah lived uh, was not in good uh, relation with the Ghanaian government and therefore Nkrumah's funeral was uh, held in Guinea and that is what you find on your screen. When he was in exile in Guinea, he became a co-president with uh, Seko Toure. Uh, and so Nkrumah was still a president in Guinea. And so the people of Guinea gave Nkrumah a state a barrier. So Nkrumah's first funeral was not held in Ghana, but it was done outside the country in Guinea. In fine, we have gathered here to set forth his brilliant light, to dispel darkness in the lives of all who are oppressed, suppressed, and distressed by racial discrimination, segregation, and colonialism, and to mourn the loss of a fallen hero who was an indefatigable and gallant indomitable fighter for the great cause of Africa. Honor! Gloire! Victoire! Vive la Révolution! After the successful overthrow of the Bujia government on 13 January 1972, the National Redemption Council NRC was formed with Lieutenant Colonel Echampon as the head of state and chairman. Some members of the council were J. H. Kobina, who was the IGP, P. F. Kwe, who was Navy commander. Major A. H. Salome, E. N. Mori as Attorney General, and many others. If you want to find out some of the reasons why K. A. Bujia was overthrown, you can check in the link in the description 
I have a separate video on that. In July 1972, few months after the overthrow of K. A. Bougia, Colonel Ignatius Kutu Echampon negotiated with the Guinea government to have Nkrumah's body repatriated and reburied in his hometown in Nkrofo in the western region of Ghana. Let's take and watch some of the footage on the day of Nkrumah's reburial at his hometown in Nkrofo in the western region. Colonel Echampon also suffered some coups against his government. The most important of these coups were in 1972 and 1976. In 1972, some group of young soldiers tried to topple Echampon's government. However, it was not successful. The 1976 coup, however, involved Major Kojo Chikata, who would later become a prominent figure in the PNDC government, led by Rawlings. A champion came to inherit a lot of debt. Ghana owned a lot of debt uh, during uh, that period, and so he uh, decided to champion a popular policy known as Yentria, which he felt that Ghana was not going to honor her uh, loan obligations to the international community and Ghana in, in simple terms was not going to pay all the loans that she owned and so this you know came with it a backlash uh, from the international communities and donors and a lot of these countries decided not to help Ghana or even uh, give any items of that sort to Ghana because Ghana was heavily dependent on importation and more so there was no um, uh, money to import all right into the country and so a champion, champ champion championed the self-reliance uh, policy operation feed yourself operation feed your industry all the uh, materials you find there were made and produced here in Ghana and for two years the country never imported anything from the outside world and this was a, a, a testimony that yes indeed the country could have done uh, better and so these are some of the uh, shots of a champion's activities in Ghana uh, during his uh, tenure as the uh, chairman of the National Redemption Council so over here a champion helped some group of farmers uh, to construct irrigation uh, to help uh, irrigate uh, their farms and so you find them digging tunnels and other things and this was one of the features of the military uh, most of them caught uh, themselves involved in the uh, work that they were doing and so all the military uh, leaders that we will come across you find them being part of the work, working with the P 
people unlike the civilians so at this period this irrigation was constructed by by Ghanaians and Ghanaians themselves with no uh, foreign aid Champon did quite a lot of things he also uh, opened you know some factories to to help in in, in, in the production of certain uh, items in the country and that is what you also find on your screen a champion indeed did a lot for Ghana um, he did a lot but it's just unfortunate that a champions uh, a champions are ruled in the history of Ghana because he came as a military uh, leader you know a lot of people don't want to talk about it and more so he came to overthrow uh, uh, the PP that the Progress Party which uh, today uh, are the remnant you know of the NPP and and so of course no NPP may want to talk about a champion and don't also forget that NDC was also the party that came to I mean the AFRC because that came to overthrow a champions and the Ekufu's uh, government are today also known as the NDC and so these two you know major political parties playing a major role in Ghana today are actually have issues with the NRC and the SMC 1 and 2 and therefore none of these political parties wants to elogize or talk about the achievement of a champion and that uh, partly has accounted for the reason why a champion's achievement uh, are less uh, visible in our history books but a champion indeed did a lot of things for Ghana in this video a champion assesses the progress that Ghana was making and also outline a five-year developmental plan from 1975 to 1980 and he is going to spell out the details of this five-year developmental plan during this period in spite of the difficulties brought about by grave international economic circumstances over which we have no control we have been able to achieve through the enthusiastic response of all Ghanaians, a reasonable measure of social and economic stability. We as a people are now more confident in tackling our national problems. We have also created the right climate in which positive development can take place. Accordingly, we are proposing guidelines to serve as a framework for our further economic development and growth during the ensuing five years. In launching these guidelines, we are calling Ghanaians to even greater sacrifices and achievements. It is the fervent hope of the government that Ghanaians will rally around now as they have in the past, and that together we shall move forward as a team to achieve a better and fuller life for all. And I'll show you a copy of the guidelines for the five-year development plan. Now, due to the work, the immense work that a champion did for the country, uh, he was loved by many, and some of the traditional chiefs held a deba to honor uh, a champion. And this is the Asante uh, people, as you can see there. I think that was uh, Pukuware and uh, Yana and other chiefs uh, who held a deba to honor a champion and what he has done for the country. And that is the deba you find on your screens.
So from 1975 onwards, the country began to experience economic hardship. Basic uh, commodities such as milk, sugar, uh, soap were all uh, scarce in the country. And, and this was mainly because of a trademark practice which was called uh, Kalabuli at that time that we all know. Some of the traders were hoarding these goods and so the video you find on the screen were soldiers who had gone to seize these items from the traders and they were distributing them to the public I think at a control price and so that is what you find on your screen and Kalabuli became very 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 uh, serious there was intense uh, pressure on a champon to actually allow election to take place but the champon was I mean other man so he decided to change the face of the National Redemption Council he felt that probably the people around him so he decided to reconstitute the NRC and so the video you find on your screen was the reconstitution of the National Redemption Council to be called the SMC one the Supreme Military Council one so that is a champion uh, ushering in the new appointees for the Supreme Military Council one in 1976 so Champon changed the National Redemption Council to the SMC-1 with the aim of uh, trying to uh, pacify the people so that uh, th there will be a new change. A Champon also uh, proposed a certain uh, reform like the UNICO whereby uh, he felt that the military and the civilians can work together. Champon actually was not, uh, he didn't want election to take place if i may i may say in that way he of course wanted to be president for quite a long time or chairman of the country for a long time on the thursday july 6 1978 the country uh, woke up to the news of the resignation of major general kutu echampo as the head of state and chairman of the supreme military council smc1 in a letter to the supreme military council General Echampo said he had taken the decision in the interest of the nation. A Lieutenant General F. W. K. Ekufu, Chief of Defense Staff, has assumed the chairmanship of the council. And following the resignation of General Echampo, the following promotions have been made. Major General R. E. A. Kote, Army Commander, now becomes Chief of Defense Staff. Brigadier N.A. Odate Wellington has now been promoted to the rank of Major General and becomes the Army Commander. And so from here, in 1978, uh, General Ekufu takes over the SMC-1. Now, uh, General Ekufu reconstitutes the SMC-1 with new uh, members uh, like the Chairman, Mr. Ernest Ako will be the IGP, uh, Ekufu will be the chairman, uh, Major General Ari Kote will be the chief of defense staff, Rear Admiral J.K. Amedome will be the Navy commander, uh, and then some of the members, Major General E.K. Utuka, and others. So, from 1978, Ekufu takes over the country and reconstitutes the SMC-1 as SMC-2. Even though on July 31st, 1978, the SMC-2, led by Akufu, proposed to return Ghana to civilian rule with a transitional interim national government. However, uh, there was intense pressure on the SMC-2 to change this idea on November 30th, 1978. The University Teachers Association of Ghana, UTAC, for instance, called on the government to produce a permanent constitution reflecting the mood of the nation for freedom of association and expression. The National Union of Ghana Student NUCS also added its voice to this call and reiterated the need for a general election by universal adult suffrage to return the country to civilian rule by July 1, 1979. In late October, announcements were made that local council elections 
will be held for the first time in 20 years and on December 13, 1978, the political party's decree was passed. It banned all old political parties like the CPP, the UP, the NAL and the NPP. On May 15, 1979, junior officers of the Air Force, led by Flight Lieutenant Jerry John Rawlings, attempted a coup d'etat against the SMC-2. Rawlings and his men were however arrested and put on trial at the Burma Hall for their role in the attempted coup. Though the coup failed, the plotters, as expressed by Mr. Akins, who was the Director of Public Prosecutions, were worried not only about the injustice in the Ghanaian society but also the tarnished image of the Ghana army due to malfeasance on the part of the members of the government. On the morning of June 4, 1979, when the court martial trying Rawlings and his accomplices was to resume sitting, another group of junior officers and regular soldiers led by Major Boachijan released Rawlings and his men from prison. The troops gained control of the Ghana Broadcasting Corporation, but not without fierce resistance from the troops loyal to the SMC-2 under the command of Major General Odate Wellington. Skirmishes took place throughout the day leading to Odate Wellington's death at the Nima police station where he had taken refuge after running short of ammunition. It led to the arrest of many SMC-2 affiliates including General Kufu and eventually to his overthrow. To avoid further bloodshed, Major General Joshua Hamidou came on air at about 8.30 p.m. to confirm the success of the coup d'etat. He urged all those still fighting in support of the SMC-2 to stop firing and return to barracks. Here to tell you just one or two things. If any further bloodshed had to be avoided in this country, Everybody might have as well realized that the ranks had borne the blood of the suffering of this country for too long. They want bloodshed. They want bloodshed. So for heaven's sake, do not bend in their way. Countrymen, it is nearly one month now since, by the spontaneous action of the junior officers and men of the Ghana Armed Forces, the government of the Supreme Military Council was overthrown and the Armed Forces Revolutionary Council was established. That action represented a revolt of the ordinary Ghanaian against social injustice, against economic hardship and against the cancer of corruption that had eaten deep into the fabric of our society. I've come to the studio today to brief you on the latest state of the revolution and to share with you our thoughts on the future of our dear nation. I do this in the conviction that there can be no revolution unless the people, all of us, really understand what it is all about and springing from that understanding genuinely commit our support to it. Let me remind you again of the stated revolution, of the stated aim of the revolution. The action taken by the junior officers and other ranks of the Ghana Armed Forces was motivated by a desire to bring justice, social, economic and political, to all citizens of Ghana. After seven years in office, 
the army was going back to barracks without any steps having been taken to punish those who had tarnished the name of the armed forces. This situation posed a threat to the continued existence of the armed forces and the stability of the country, hence the spontaneous action of June 4th to preempt a coup immediately after handover to a civilian administration. We have all heard from every political party say how corrupt the country has become. But from past experience, we know that none of them would do a thorough job of eradicating corruption once they came into office. Since the future belongs to the young, it was felt that we must safeguard the supreme national interest and bring social justice into the body politic. The main purpose of the exercise is to ensure that the gap between the haves and the have-nots, the rich and poor, is bridged. This is a limited objective which would help the incoming administration to take all necessary long-term measures for bringing stability to the nation. I know that there are many Ghanaians and many friends of Ghana abroad who have been distressed by some recent developments. We have also been made aware of the depth of feeling both at home and abroad about the turn of events in Ghana. Ghana has had a long tradition of tolerance and respect for the rule of law and internationally accepted principles of justice. The fear, both within and outside Ghana, is that we may now be abandoning this tradition in favor of some arbitrary conception of instant justice. This fear, though understandable, is not well founded as a better appreciation of the circumstances will reveal. Let me tell you in simple language. The people of Ghana have endured hunger for far too long. There is not one single worker who could make ends meet, and the miracle is that the people have been able to endure this for so long. You may say that this has been possible because of our excellent tradition of tolerance and patience. But patience and tolerance can be dangerous because they allow a buildup of anger to such an extent that when the bubble finally busts, there can hardly be a way of containment. The demise of SMC2 saw a new military junta, the Armed Forces Revolutionary Council, AFRC, on the Ghanaian political scene. Rawlings became the chairman, with Major Boachijan as the spokesman. Other members of the AFRC were Major Mensa Puku, Major Mensa Budema, Warrant Officer Class 2 Obin, Private Ousu Edu, and Corporal Ousu Boati. General Hamidu was named as the liaison officer between the AFRC and the government bureaucracy. The AFRC declared that the coup d'etat was not to stop the return to civilian rule but to clear up the mess created by the previous regimes. The AFRC established the People's Revolutionary Court, also known as the Kangaroo Courts. These were special courts set up to trial various offenses against the state. Many people were trialed and those found guilty of charges preferred against them were punished. Among those jailed were J.W.K. Harley, a former IGP and a member of the National Liberation Council, NLC, was jailed 25 years. E.O. Boache alias Boache Matres, a businessman, was jailed 25 years. Ernest Aku, a former IGP, was jailed 25 years. B.S.K. Kwache, also a former IGP, was jailed 25 years. And E.K. Ousu of Kous Motors was also jailed 25 years. Others were U.K. Yamwa, alias Kodu Sadi, a businessman, was jailed 20, 20 years. Squadron leader George Degu, squadron leader Abebrese, Colonel Alhaji, group captain Jackson, Colonel Amevo, 20 years each. On July 4, 1979, the Inspector General of Police, Colonel Lamte, announced that 36 senior police officers were to proceed on compulsory leave as part of the cleaning up exercise. 
they were accused of straightforward cases of stealing, holding, profiteering, amassing illegal wealth, and acting as frontmen for women and other businesses concerned in the procurement of essential commodities. As a first step in the house cleaning exercise, Colonel Ignatius Kutu a champion of the NRC and Major General E.K. Utuka were executed at the Teshi military range on June 16, 1979 after a hastily assembled revolutionary court. Ten days later, June 26, the death sentence on General F.W.K. Ekufu of the SMC-2, Lieutenant General A.A. Afrifa of the NLC, both were ex-head of state, Major General R.E. Kote, Air Vice Marshal George Yawache, Royal Admiral J.K. Amedume, and Colonel R.J.A. Feli was pronounced and implemented. They had apparently been found guilty of corrupt practices, while the Christian Council of Ghana pleaded with the AFRC to temper justice with mercy. Many ordinary people, workers, and especially students from the university demanded let the blood flow in support of the executions. These officers were executed on the same day of 26 June 1979. As a way of purging of corruption, women were arrested for selling commodities above the control prices. They were stripped naked and stripped in the open. Many Lebanese, Syrian and Indian businessmen who had always been alleged to be part of these corrupt practices were rounded up at random and brutalized. Some had their houses looted, dismissal of public servants, confiscation of assets and properties were applied as a means of stamping out corruption and also other malpractices which crippled the country's economy. Though Rollins became an instant hero for his patriotism, courage and dislike for injustice. Ghanaians were not enthused about the country experiencing another long period of military rule and therefore the AFRC had to abide by its own promise of going back to the barracks on October 1st, 1979. For these reasons, the elections which had been slated for June 18, 1979 were duly held. Some of the political parties that contested the 1979 elections were the People's National Party PNP, headed by Dr. Hila Liman, the Popular Front Party PFP, led by Victor Ousu, the United National Convention UNC, under the leadership of William Oforiata, and the Action Congress Party ACP with Kennel. A retired Frank George Benasco as its head. Others were the Third Force Party, TFP, and the Social Democratic Front, SDF, led by John Bilson and Ibrahim Manama, respectively. After the election, the parliamentary votes showed a clear majority for the PNP, which secured 71 out of the 140 seats contested. Dr. Hila Liman, the PNP presidential candidate, together with his running mate, J.W. DeGrab Johnson, pulled 35.51% of vote cast as opposed to the Victor Ousu's 29.69% of vote cast. Though the PNP won the majority in the parliamentary election, its candidate failed to pull 50% plus one of votes cast as required by the law to have outright victory and therefore another balloting had to be organized between the two leading contestants namely Dr. Hile Limand and Victor Ousu. In the second round of the presidential election held on 9th July 1979, Dr. Hile Limand pulled 61.98% as against Victor Ousu's 29.69%. 
On, on September 24, 1979, the AFRC handed power to Dr. Hillary Mann. For the third time, Ghanaians had the chance to be governed under parliamentary democracy, and this ushered the country into the Third Republic. This Revolutionary Council, during our short stay in power, have demonstrated openly what many people had only suspected before, namely, that the holding of office in government in this country had in almost all cases been used to plunder the wealth of the nation. Ghana is looking up to you. Thank you. Now that the people of Ghana have democratically elected me to the, their president, I call on all in the true spirit of patriotism to come together as one united country determined to solve the many and difficult problems facing us. Let us marshal the rich human resources available throughout the country and together march forward in unity and service to the nation. All of us have a duty to work to salvage our shattered economy and regain the lost image and prestige of Mother Ghana. Each and every one of us has a role to play. To this end, no sacrifice can be too great, no offer can be too little. As emphasized during the election campaign, my administration shall be based on discipline, probity, and hard work. I assure you, I assure you that I shall do my best to uphold these principles. I will set the appropriate examples myself. And of course, I expect and will insist on efficiency in the various sectors of the economy and in the public services. On 31st December 1981, there was the return of Jerry John Rawlings in less than three years. The PNP government was overthrown in a bloodless coup led by Jerry John Rawlings on 31st December 1981. Rawlings declared that holy war was necessary due to the failure of the PNP government to provide effective leadership and the collapse of the national economy and state services. He went on to announce the suspension of the 1979 Third Republican Constitution, and the dismissal of all members of government, the dissolution of parliament, and the banning of political parties. Rawlings proclaimed the establishment of the Provisional National Defense Council, PNDC. This military government ruled Ghana from December 1981 till 7 January 1993, when Rawlings was elected as the first president of the Fourth Republic under the government of the National Democratic Congress. In less than a year into the PNDC's regime, 30th June 1982, Ghana was again hit with another sad news. This time it was not a coup, but the country woke up to the news of the gruesome murder of three high court judges and a retired army officer. These high court judges were Cecilia Corantin, Frederick Opoku Sakodie, and Kwejo Ejei Ejapon. The retired army officer was Sam Aqua, who was then the head of personnel at Ghana Industrial Holding Corporation, Gihok. The reasons for their murder was unknown. 
Cecilia Crantin Addo was adopted and murdered in secret by some unknown men on 30th June 1982, along with the two other Supreme Court justices, Frederick Opoku Sakodie and Kojo Eje Ejapon, and the retired army officer Sam Aqua. The murder took place at the Bundasi military shooting range in the Accra Plains during the hours of a night time curfew. The unknown men had taken their captives to the Bundasi military firing range and executed them. The murderers carried along a gallon of fuel patrol with which they set fire to the bodies to cover up their crime. But historical accounts have noted that it rained that day, so the bodies did not burn as the murderers had wanted. Their charred bodies were discovered in the same location the following day. Following intense pressure on Rawlings and the PNDC, a special investigation board, SIB, was formed by the government to investigate the murderers. The SIB was headed by former Chief Justice, Mr. Justice Azukrepi, to unravel the mystery. In their report, the SIB established that the adoption and murder were a plot hatched with the connivance of members of the PNDC. These were Captain Amedeka, Tony Tepo, Zandu and Heckley, as well as ex-PNDC member Amatekwe. The SIB also found out that the entire plot was masterminded by Captain Kojuchikata, a PNDC member in charge of national security. However, the PNDC rejected that particular aspect of the report and let Captain Chikata and four others of the hook for lack of evidence. In 1992, the independent newspaper reported findings of the SIB's inquiry in Ghana, which it said had recommended the prosecution of 10 people for the murder, including Ghana's head of national security at that time, Kodo Chikata. Chikata, who was Rawlings' right-hand man, filed a defamation lawsuit against the independent on 26 March 1993, which he agreed to drop after the independent published a correction statement in September 1998, in which they clarified that they had not intended to suggest that Chikata was guilty of the crime. In four of the nine suspects were jailed, when on 19 June 1983, there was a jailbreak at the Insawam Medium Prisons and the Asha Fort Prisons. Captain Amedeka escaped from captivity and has since not been seen. But his three accomplices, Tony Tepo, Asanzu, and Heki, as well as ex PNDC member Amate Kwe, were executed by firing squad. Before his death in 2020, Mr. Rawlings always insisted that before Amato Kwe was executed, he confessed at stake to forcefully accusing Mr. Chikata of involvement in the execution of the charges. People still continue to level allegations against me as a conspirator in the crime to murder the judges. And was it possible for the four young soldiers, corporals, lance corporals, to undertake that major activity without authority from the superior authority, without orders or instructions from the superior authority? Could they have done that on their own initiative? My dear General, one of them, without any Body's authority killed my relative. The, the, those young soldiers were not taking official orders to go and kill people. They were not taking official orders. 
Would, the, the circumstances have been different? Your would, uncle, what? sorry to, I said, wouldn't the circumstances have been different? Um, I don't know the sort of the reasons why they would have killed your uncle. I don't know. Uh, but whether they knew him or there was some sort of personal reason, I don't know. I, would, I don't know the circumstances. But here we have the judges and our own colleagues and upper, whom they didn't know. They didn't know where they lived. They had no sort of relationship with them. They bore them no grudge. Could they have done that on their own initiative? In the evidence of the ISID, they all stated that they were doing what they did under the instructions of Ahmad Tikuri. That is what all of them said in the evidence before the ISID and before the tribunal. Um, Ahmad Ekwe was a member of the PNDC, yes. That is what they all said. Did he hold any special uh, position? He was the, a member of the PNDC in charge of TUC affairs. So does it mean any member of PNDC can get hold of any of the soldiers and give them orders to do anything? That is what they did. I'm not saying that that is legal. That is what they said they did. Well, the unfortunate thing is that um, they are gone. Amatekwe is gone and uh, it's difficult to... Um, but it sounds a, a little bit uh, difficult to understand the system whereby any member of government would just order soldiers to you know, undertake such. My dear General, that is why Matikwe was prosecuted and executed. It was not right for him to have done what he did. It was not a matter of system. Matikwe was responsible for the crime he committed with America and the others. Okay, so uh, thank you for watching. Uh, I hope you enjoyed uh, the video. This video in uh, particular has been a very a tough one for me but I am happy I've been able to uh, pull it off so and I know you uh, enjoyed uh, the video as well uh, this has been a project that uh, after I mean I've been thinking about it for a very long time I, I started searching for a video like this on the net but I hardly got one so I decided to put one together and I know that you uh, love it in my next uh, video, I'll continue with the story, with the history. I'll start from the Fourth Republic. I mean, we've we've literally done everything. We are left with the Fourth Republic. So, in my next uh, video, I'll, I may I may want to uh, look at the Fourth Republic uh, from 1993 up to say 2004, and 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 I think that is also a vacuum that we must fill. So yeah, uh, do not forget to share this video to your friends in other schools, you know, institutions, people who may be interested. Uh, share our links and do not forget to subscribe to our channel as well. Uh, thank you for your time and thank you for uh, subscribing. Have a nice day. Bye-bye.